Welcome to Bible Mine. We can't just dive into Azusa Street without talking about William Seymour. Uh, William Joseph Seymour was born in Centerville, Louisiana. He's a good old Louisiana boy. Uh, I mean, that, and that's way down there, too. It's like uh, if, if you see somebody with their shoes off, they probably have webbed feet. That's a Louisiana joke. You may not know that. But, uh, but he was from way down there. He was uh, uh, born on May 2nd, 1870, and uh, he was, uh, his parents were former slaves. His uh, dad actually fought in the Civil War and died of uh, diseases and stuff that he had uh, contracted while he was um, fighting in the war. Uh, he was raised kind of a mi- mixture of Baptist and Catholic if you can imagine that. So uh, early life, uh, Catholic, and then they moved to Centerville, and uh, uh, there was a little Baptist church that they were going going to there. Uh, As a youth, he he had many dreams and visions. It just seemed like God was was speaking to him, even as a youth. In uh, 1895, at the age of 25, he moves to Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, probably because uh, in in the South, post-slavery, Slaves, slaves were set free, but you know there was a lot of racial tension, and so it was easier up north. And so he moves to Indianapolis and worked as a, a railroad porter. He was introduced to the holiness movement through Daniel S. Warner. Uh, it's an organization we didn't really cover this one, but um, and and just so you'll know, there's no way we could cover every every movement that started up, but just. Uh, his organization was called Church of God Anderson, or Anderson, Illinois, was where they were based out of. Uh, they were also referred to, you may see, uh, called the Evening, uh, Evening Light Saints. And so uh, William Seymour started uh, going to this and, and, and connecting with them a little bit. And that was when he was introduced to holiness uh, and, and that type of theology. And it was really a, a radical brand of holiness. They believed in uh, the, the, a second blessing of sanctification, meaning that after salvation, then there was a, a work that began. And, and then, uh, then when you were sanctified, you had reached a, a place of complete holiness. They believed in divine healing, premillennialism, and a, a promise of a, a world wide Holy Ghost uh, revival that would happen just before the end times. And so this is what he was exposed to really for the first time in his life. In 1901, this is some of his travels here. Uh, in 1901, Seymour moved to Cincinnati where he worked as a waiter and uh, probably attended, uh, it was called uh, God's Bible School and Training Home. Uh, it was a school founded by a holiness preacher named Martin Wells Knapp. Knapp taught premillennialism, and uh, uh, he really took seriously dreams and visions. So, so this kind of clicked with uh, Seymour because he was a man that felt like you know, God was speaking to him in this way. Uh, while he was in Cincinnati, Seymour contracted smallpox. You know, we had a conversation about smallpox before, before class, but uh, he contracted smallpox, and he lost vision in his left eye. And so uh, some, some refer to him as a one-eyed preacher. Uh, but William moved to Houston in 1903, to really at first to search for his family, but he joined a small holiness church that was pastored by Lucy Farrow. And uh, so Lucy was associated with Charles Paul. And then we talked about we talked about him. So you hear his name several times tonight. Uh, but she was associated with Charles Palm, and there was one particular time that she actually went to work for Palm as a nanny for their kids and kind of joined their evangelistic team. So she asked uh, William Seymour if he would pastor her church while she's on this assignment. And so he agreed, and so uh, William is, is pastoring this church. Lucy had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues while she was uh, with uh, at in Charles Palms Church, and uh, so she had this experience. She was telling William, William Seymour about this experience, and he was interested, but he had a lot of questions. Like, I'm, I'm not sure about this, so you know, let's let's talk about it a little bit. And so she put him in touch with uh, Charles Palm. So upon talking to uh, the uh, talking between uh, William and Charles Palm, they talked, and, and Palm convinced William Seymour that you need to attend my Bible school that I just opened here in Houston. And uh, so he agreed, and this is the, uh, a picture of the Bible school there. And there was a problem, though, because of the Jim Crow laws at the time, 
Whites and blacks couldn't go to school together. They couldn't be in the same classroom. But Parham really felt like Seymour needed to be here. So as silly as this sounds to us, they worked, they, they worked out a loophole Okay, saying that, okay, you can't stay overnight in the Bible school, but you can come to class, but you can't come in the classroom. You can sit outside, and we'll leave the door open, and, and you can look in through the window, and sometimes he would sit up here on the veranda, and they'd leave a window open or whatever, so, so he could take part in the class. He just couldn't come in the class. And that, that sounds terrible to us, but that's the culture of that time, and that's what they had to deal with. But Parham was insistent, you know, I don't want to break the law with this, but you need to be part of this. And so that's kind of what they worked out in that. Um, so uh, even through all of that, uh, one thing that was written several times about William Seymour is that he was uh, just incredibly humble about the whole situation, and, and you know he didn't he didn't let it get to him, and, and he was he was hungry enough that said oh, I'll do whatever I have to do to be able to take part of this. So uh, Seymour became uh, convinced that Paul's teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of tongues was scripturally sound, and so he added that to his theology of well well-rounded holiness that he had already uh, established in his life. In 1906, William Seymour got an invitation to come be a part of a new church plant in Los Angeles, California. And uh, at first, Parham said, ah, you're not ready for that yet. And uh, Seymour didn't agree. <laughs> he was like, my I think I'm ready. And so he hadn't, he hadn't been filled with the Holy Spirit yet, but he felt that he was ready for this task. And so the, this church in Los Angeles took up a collection for him to ride the train out from Houston to Los Angeles so that he could come uh, be part of this church plant. So we're going to press, everybody press pause. Okay, we're going to pause him right there. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, at uh, 5.12 a.m. on April 18, 1906, an earthquake of 8.3 on the Richter scale shook San Francisco Bay. The unpredictable San Andreas Fault, 800 miles long, it shifted, it's, it did its thing, and uh, devastation followed. Violent shock, shock waves followed. Uh, some of them lasted 45 to 60 seconds. That don't sound like a long time, but you know, if there's a whole lot of shaking going on, that's a long time. And so the earthquake was felt from southern Oregon all the way down to south of Los Angeles and inland as far, about 50 miles inland as far as Nevada. And so, I mean, this was, this was just a, 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 a huge earthquake, and uh, it was the most destructive earthquake in North American history. Uh, it ruptured gas lines. And these ruptured gas lines erupted in fire, and so things started burning. Uh, it, it was a devastating scene. 700 people lay, lay dead among the devastation in the middle of town. And so men and women immediately began to blame God. God did this to us, and they would curse God, and they would shake their fist at God. Well, there were some that decided we're going to take advantage of this to, to promote God. And so they, uh, they printed out some tracts. I mean, within hours of the earthquake, they printed out tracts. And so they started passing these tracts out saying that, uh, that uh, it, what they were calling it the, a tragedy, a judgment, and a warning from God, from the God that they were cursing. And so they were trying to say, hey, you know, God's trying to get our attention. Some look back and they wonder if maybe... Uh, Romans 8, 19 through 22 could be applied. It says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. I don't know if there's, an, there's another groaning going on, but God's stirring the hearts of people today. I mean, I know many of you probably talk to people that you know in other places, and, and, it's ain't, and there's so many churches right now that are just like, I feel like, I feel like we're about to see revival. And that's what, 
uh, that some people look back on the Azusa Street revival and they say maybe maybe this earthquake was all of uh, all of creation was groaning because of what was about to happen. So let's look at some of the influences that we've talked about that led up to this. Uh, you remember when we were talking about the Second Great Awakening, Charles Finney, incredible revivals across the land. We talked about Cane Ridge and you know just thousands and thousands of people experienced a powerful move of God. Uh, we talked about Topeka and the outpouring there with Charles Palm and then what happened in Houston and God pouring out his spirit there. And so God was setting the stage for something incredible. Then we had some influence from the Welsh Revival. In Los Angeles, uh, Frank Bartleman, we talked about him last time we were together. Uh, he was a journal journalist and a holiness preacher. Uh, he corresponded with Evan Roberts of the great Welsh Revival requesting special prayer. And uh, one letter from Roberts responded, I pray God to hear your prayers, to keep your faith strong, and to save California. And then we talked about Joseph Smale, pastor of First Baptist Church in Los Angeles. Uh, he actually went to the Welsh Revival, right? He went to, he went to Wales and uh, experienced the revival firsthand and even spoke with Evan Roberts personally. And so many began to seek the Lord for, and this sounds foreign to us now with what we know about Los Angeles today, but all of Los Angeles was seeking God for revival. And all of Los Angeles was just in this kind of waiting like kind of, kind of just, you know, anticipating God to do something great. And so many uh, began to seek the Lord for revival. And it, it's like, how many of you like to barbecue? Yeah. Should we have the argument gas versus charcoal? Charcoal better. <laughs> you know, I used, to be a, I used to be a charcoal only man. It's like, nah, don't give me no gas grill. You know, I want I, I, charcoal. Ah, that's the only way to go, right? And so one day... Uh, one Father's Day, my wife bought me a gas grill. This was, I mean, we, we'd probably only been married three or four years. And she buys me this gas grill. Uh, I'm just grumbling to myself, oh, 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 gas grill. Oh, oh. I love gas grills. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have to prep. I didn't have to shake the car charcoal out. I didn't have to let it burn down for 30 minutes. I mean, it was ready to go. It was great. Uh, so now... Uh, 35 years later, I have a grill that has a charcoal side and a gas side, so I, you know, I, I can go either way. But charcoal, you know, you, you, you put it on there, and of course, unless you get, you know, Kingsford Edge match light or whatever the fancy stuff is, you know, if you get the cheap stuff, what do you have to do to it? Lighter fluid. You have to Next jar. <laughs> and you got to let it set for a little bit. If you light it then, what happens? Yeah. <laughs> so you have to let it set for a little bit. Then. And so it's almost like God had put the lighting fluid on Los Angeles, and it was sitting, and it was just kind of, it was just kind of soaking in right there with all this that happened. So what happened? I didn't have pictures then. I looked and looked and looked. Found no pictures. But there was a lady named Neely Terry, and she attended a small holiness church started by Julia Hutchins. Now, Julia Hutchins uh, had uh, been going to Second Baptist Church in Los Angeles, and she started teaching holiness uh, and sanctification as a second work of grace. Well, that got her kicked out. <laughs> so, uh, so she went down the road and she started another work, just kind of a kind of a fledgling work. They really didn't even have a building; they were meeting at different places. And uh, so, uh, this is where this Neely Terry was attending. And so she made a trip to visit family in Houston, Texas. So while she was in Houston, she visits this church that's being pastored by William Seymour. And William Seymour is pre preaching on the baptism in the Holy Spirit and, and uh, the evidence of speaking in tongues. And she's like, I don't know about all this, but uh, he seems like a pretty good preacher and seems like a pretty solid dude. And so she gets back and she talks to Julia Hutchins about, you know, I think we need to invite this man to come up and be a part of our work here. So they take up a collection and, and send the invitation. And uh, so um, in February 1906... Uh, he received financial help from the church and, and a blessing from Parham uh, for his planned one-month visit. So he was supposed to only go for, for a month. 
and uh, get up there and, and preach at this church and you know kind of help it get started or whatever. Uh, Seymour would write this. It was the divine call that brought me from Houston, Texas to Los Angeles. The Lord put it on the heart of one of the saints in Los Angeles to write me that she felt the Lord would have me come there, and I felt uh, it was the leading of the Lord. The Lord provided the means, and I came to take charge of the mission on Santa Fe Street. And so for his first sermon, that first, uh, first time that he was there, he preached Acts 2 forward and preached about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in tongues. And, and uh, so then when he returned the next service, uh, the door was padlocked and he wasn't allowed to come in. <laughs> and so he was, he was locked out. Well, that kind of really, the, the, the holiness doctrine and all that they were teaching, that when, it, you know, when he, was, he was adamant that uh, you know, the evidence of speaking in tongues was the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if you've not had this evidence, then you haven't been filled. Well, the sanctification teaching that they taught said that when you're sanctified, that's the same as being filled with the Holy Spirit. So in essence, he was saying if you haven't spoken tongues, then you're not filled with the Spirit. And so now you can kind of see where, you know, out, buddy. And so uh, he was out on the street. Well, there was a guy named Edward Lee. He was one of the members of the, the Santa Fe Mission. And uh, he felt pity on him. He actually had already uh, scheduled uh, William Seymour to come eat lunch with him. And so uh, he invited him over, and they decided to, to give this penniless, uh, homeless preacher <laughs> a place to stay. And so William Seymour goes in, and uh, they put him up for a little while. And uh, he spent much time uh, in prayer. Uh, in private prayer and fasting, and he became known of, uh, uh, as a man of unusual prayerfulness. He would pray typically five hours a day. Anybody here typically spend about five hours a day? Well, you know, I got work, I got kids, I got to mow the grass, I got, you know, it's all this stuff. But, I mean, he didn't have anything else to do, maybe. <laughs> but he was spending five hours a day praying. And so he invited the Lees. Uh, to say, you know, why don't you come pray with me? And so those two started praying with him, and they spent hours and hours and hours uh, together praying. Well, this attracted a little attention, and so some other people from the mission, uh, not really with the permission of Julia Hutchins, you know, she wasn't really a, a big fan of her members being a part of this, but they started coming to these prayer meetings and uh, maybe, uh, you know, just taking part in, in what God was going on and seeking the Lord together with, with William Seymour and Mr. Lee. When Mr. Lee invited Seymour to minister in a small house, uh, it was a small home Bible study and a, a prayer meeting at the home of Richard and Ruth Asbury. This house was on 214 North Bonnie Bray Street in Los Angeles. Anybody ever heard of Bonnie Bray? Street. Okay, uh, this is a this this is a very famous house, uh, and and it's a museum now. Obviously, all these things get turned into museums. But uh, he agreed, and these prayer meetings at Bonnie Bray continued for about five weeks until mid-April 1906. Well, news of the meetings started to spread. These these prayer meetings that were going on, and really there was no there was no breakthrough or no no big. Uh, you know, to do at first, they just had heard these people were getting together and they're seeking God. And so people started coming. And at first it was uh, mostly people from African-American uh, churches that were here, but then others started coming. You started having uh, people from a lot of the, if you want to call it, white churches or whatever, start to come. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't about any kind of racial thing. Everybody was just seeking God. And that's all the focus was, was just seeking, seeking God. And so um, Seymour after a while, uh, felt that uh, he should invite Lucy Farrow to come speak uh, because, I mean, she had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and so thought, well, I'll, I'll have her come speak. And so they take up a collection and they get her to come. And when she comes, uh, Seymour declares a 10-day fast. We're going to fast and we're going to pray for 10 days. Well, on April 9th, 1906, uh, after five weeks of Seymour's preaching and prayer, and only three days into this 10-day fast, uh, they were at the, the house of the Lees, and before they left to go to Bonnie Bray, uh, uh, 
Edward Lee had, uh, I can't remember what it was, but some, some, something he needed prayer for, physical, uh, something he, and the challenge that he was having. And so he asked Seymour, he said, hey, before we leave to go over the house, will you pray for me? And so, you know, Seymour prayed for him, and, uh, then after it was through, he said, will you pray for me to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And Seymour was hesitant at first, because he felt like, well, I haven't even received it myself, so, you know, how can I pray for you? But, he relented and he agreed. He laid hands on Edward Lee, and Edward Lee uh, just just began to speak in tongues and was glorious baptized in in the Holy Spirit. Well, they prayed together, and uh, uh, then you know after all this happened, then they they were excited, and so they they run to down to body, Bonnie Bray uh, excited. So they rush down there, and uh, uh, so Seymour shares uh, Lee's testimony. And then begins to preach again on Acts 2 4. Well, as he's preaching, spontaneous praise began to erupt, and, and people just began to praise the Lord. And all at once, six people fell out under the power of the, the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. One of these we talked about last week, her name was, you might want to guess, it starts with a Jenny and ends with more. <laughs> Y'all remember Jenny Moore? We talked about her. We talked about a lot of people, I know. But Jenny Moore was going to, you remember what church? She was going to Joseph Smale's church. Okay? She had been coming to these prayer meetings. Uh, something else, and this is jumping ahead of the story a little bit, but uh, Jenny Moore eventually becomes uh, Mrs. William Seymour later down the, later, a couple of years down the line. But anyway, so, so Jenny Moore, uh, she was baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues, and then uh, after a little while, she gets up off the floor, she goes to a piano in the house, and starts just playing the piano. She'd never had a lesson, never, never played the piano before, and she just starts playing the piano and singing in the Spirit. And, and so the place just starts erupting, and, and people are, are you know, being blessed, and, and the Holy Spirit's falling in that place. Three days later... Well, uh, William Seymour is like, okay, you know, God's beginning to do things. People are getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, don't forget me. <laughs> and so he spends most of that night praying, all night praying. And the next day, on the third day of, of this breakout, breakthrough, uh, uh, William Seymour receives the Holy Spirit and begins speaking in tongues. Uh, the meetings at the Bonnie Bray House ran 24 hours a day a day for at least three days, and uh, people reported falling under the power of God and receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit while listening to Seymour preach from across the street. So he would come out on the porch here uh, and, and just begin to preach, and, and people would just gather in because you can only put so many people in, in a little house like this. And so they were, they were crowding in, and he would come out on, the, on this natural stage on the, on the porch on the house and begin to preach, and people were just falling out on the sidewalks, and people were being filled with the Holy Spirit all across that neighborhood. There was a, a, a resident who gave this testimony, said... Um, they shouted three days and three nights. It was Easter season. The people came from everywhere. By the next morning, there was no way of getting near the house. As people came in, they would fall under God's power, and the whole city was stirred. They shouted until the foundation of the house gave way, but no one was hurt. And that did happen. The porch actually broke off the front of the house, and there's part of the foundation of the house that, that was damaged because too many people were, were trying to get in that house. And so they knew... We gotta have another place. <laughs> We're about to wreck this house. So, uh, so they did a little searching around, and they were able to find a suitable location. This place was 312 Azusa Street, um, and so they secure this place, and the mission was begun. It was really in a, it was an abandoned two-story building. There wasn't anything going on at the time, and uh, it was only about. I meant to step this place off and to see about how, but it was 60 by 40. It was an empty building. It was once Stephen's uh, African, uh, African Methodist Episcopal, or AME, uh, church we still have. And, uh, uh, but since then, it was a warehouse, a lumber yard, a stockyard, a tombstone shop. And most recently, it had been a stable on the ground floor with rooms to rent upstairs. And so upstairs, they had different rooms, and this was just like one big building. Uh, but there was a lot of cleanup to do because... It was a stable, <laughs> and so they had, they had uh, lot, lots of stuff to do to get it ready. 
uh, after they had secured the building, uh, they still, you know, there was some construction stuff that had to be done and, you know, had, had to uh, do some repairs or whatever, and he didn't know how they were going to do that because uh, repairs cost money. They didn't have any money. And so he uh, uh, arose from, from night. The Lord had given him a vision and said, I want you to go down. I want you to get on, on, on this train. And so he went down and he got on the train. And he was like, I want you to get off on this stop. And so he got off on that stop. It's like, okay, I don't don't know what I'm doing. He's like, okay, I want you to go down to this building and go in that door. So he goes in there and goes in that door, and he said, I want you to go up the stairs, and I want you to knock on this apartment door. And so he's like, okay. You know, and so this, by the time he gets there, it's like 10, 30, 11 at night, and here's, uh, you know, this, this uh, you know, man in the middle of the night coming and, and knocking on a, on a door. You know, I mean, he didn't even know what, you know, I don't know what's going on inside this house or whatever. Well, what was going on inside this house is there was a ladies' prayer meeting going on, and they were praying for revival. So he knocks on this door, and, you know, they're like, anybody expecting anybody? (laughs) I don't know. And so, you know, they probably sheepishly opened the door, you know, and here's this, you know, big guy standing there, (laughs) one-eyed one-eyed guy at that, you know, <laughs> that had been riding the train, you know, so, but, uh, so they opened the door, and I don't know if it, you know, I guess it was the spirit that quickened it to me, he, to him, he said, have you been praying for revival? They said, we have, and so they opened the door, and they let him in, and he, he shared with them what God was doing, and, and what, uh, what their needs were, well, they, uh, I, I don't know what, type of people they were or whatever like that, but they took up a collection right there and it was enough money to do the repairs on Azusa Street. And so they were able to to get the things done and get it cleaned up and kind of get it in, you know, it's not going to fall down on your head kind of thing, kind of business. They had no furniture. Uh, two boxes were nailed together and I, uh, here they were shoe crates, I believe, you know, that uh, like that you pack a lot of shoes in but they uh, for merchandising but they nailed them together for a pulpit the pews were flat boards nailed over barrels with no back how many of you would come to church today if you didn't have padded pews to get what they got, yeah. <laughs> yeah maybe so maybe so we'll see uh, but the, there was you know there were no hymnals there were no instruments you know there was no no worship team uh no air conditioning. Uh, they they didn't they didn't take up an offering. There was a, a box over on the side with a sign over it that says "Settle with the Lord." <laughs> so I guess you know I guess that did the trick. You know, uh, Frank Bartleman wrote. Meetings began at 10 o'clock every morning, and are continued until near midnight. There are three altar services daily. The altar is a plank on two chairs in the center of the room. And here the Holy Ghost falls on men and women and children. Proud preachers and laymen with great heads, (laughs) filled and inflated with all kinds of theories and beliefs, have come here from all parts, have humbled themselves and thrown away their notions, and have wept in conscious emptiness before God and begged to be endued with power from on high. And every honest believer has received the wondrous incoming of the Holy Spirit to, uh, to fill and thrill and melt uh, and energize his physical frame and faculties. And the Spirit has witnessed to his presence by using the vocal organs in speaking forth in a new tongue. And so this is Frank Bartleman, is one of his many, I mean, he literally wrote the book on Azusa Street, but many articles, and we talked about that last week, or last, yeah, last week when we were talking about Frank Bartleman, but uh, that was some of his recollection. There were, like I said, these rooms upstairs that had previously been rented out. Well, they turned those into prayer rooms that if you needed prayer, you could go up to these different rooms and be prayed for. And so all this, it wasn't just like uh, you were sitting there all day listening to a sermon or anything like that. There was all kind of prayer, all kind of things going on in here. And then when William Seymour would get ready to preach, there would be a bell that would ring, and then everybody would come down out of the rooms or whatever, and they would gather in, in that area, and then he would preach. And then sometimes uh, he wouldn't preach for very long. Uh, if I can go back to that. Uh, so these boxes were... Uh, empty on the back side and they say that he would kneel down and he would stick his head in the top box and and just pray 
and just just pray and let let God do what God wanted to do and let the Holy Spirit move. And then at whatever point he was prompted, he would stand up. And who would begin to preach the word with boldness. And then sometimes he would, he would you know, kneel back down and, and just let God do what God wanted to do. The first uh, secular news reports of the revival appeared on April 18th, 1906. Does anybody remember what that date is? The earthquake. The earthquake. The, so on April 17th, the night before, this Los Angeles Daily Times sent a reporter to the evening service, and uh, he filed reports that were highly critical of everything that was going on. And of course, you know, misunderstanding, but some of you can see a little bit of what's there. But uh, some of the headlines to the article were Weird Babble of Tongues, New Sect of Fanatics is Breaking Loose, Wild Scene Last Night on Azusa Street. I, I wish I had one of those, you know, those. Uh, 1920s uh, news reporter voices that you you know that that you hear on TV or whatever. I don't know if that's really how they talk, but it's like we're well, a battle of tongues, <laughs> that kind of thing. New sect of fanatics is breaking loose. Wild scene last night on the Zusa Street. Gurgle of wordless talk by sister. <laughs> I don't know if that's how they talk, but anyway. So this paper comes out on April 18th in the morning. In the morning. Just before the earthquake, and so uh, you, know, you know what might have been on some people's minds? Uh, you shouldn't have wrote that, <laughs> bad boy. Uh, that's right. You caused the earthquake. It's all your fault. But guess what it did? Did it deter people from coming? You know what do they say about publicity? The only bad publicity is no publicity. <laughs> you know, so this just piqued people's curiosity. Is like. Well, what is all this stuff? We got to go see. You know, we got to go check this out. Uh, it said, and remember, we had testimonies like this when we talked about the Cane Ridge revival. But there would be people coming with the intent of being critical and fall under the power of God, and God get a hold of them, and you know they couldn't do anything except just uh, weep in the presence of the Lord. Uh, there was a, a reporter that had heard of this circus-like atmosphere, and he came to report about it. He was a foreign, a foreign reporter. And uh, he sort of sat as far back as he could and, you know, just tried to stay out of the fray or whatever. And uh, so he was just, you know, just kind of observing. Well, there was, there was a message in tongues, and uh, this, this young girl, she gets up and, and she speaks in tongues. And, uh, you know, he's just, he's just floored by it. And so he has to find her at, at the end of the uh, service or whatever. After that part was over, he, he chases her down, and, and he said, uh, he said, where did you learn whatever language that was? It was his, his, native. his native language. He said, because, he said, you called out all kind of things that I've been doing. And there's no way you could have known that. And she, she said that in his native tongue. She said, I don't know. Said it wasn't me. There was a, another similar situation. There was a, 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 a guy that had come over. He was a Jew, and he had come over and, and was trying to get ammunition against Christianity, you know, because, uh, you know, try to, to, you know, put down the, these Christians or whatever. And so he was a teacher. He was going to go back, and he was going to bring this ammunition about Christianity. And uh, so he was... Uh, going going down this uh, this hall, and this girl stops and she points at him and she speaks in he in fluent Hebrew and tells him what his name was, where he was from, what he was doing there, and and all of this he hadn't even spoke to her, and so there was these things that that just kept kept going on during this revival. There was a what God was doing things in specific ways in different people, so it's not it wasn't the William Seymour show. Okay, God was was working through multiple people, and there was this one young man. He was like 18 years old, and uh, so uh, God had had started for some reason started using him to pray for deaf people, and so people would come in, they would be deaf, he would pray for them, and and they would receive their hearing, and so this uh, uh, school of de the school for deaf people uh, heard about it, so they brought. 35 people from the school, the deaf people, uh, to to Azusa Street, and they find this 18-year-old, and they said, you know, hey, will you will you pray for them? And he said, if I do, you're going to be out of a job. <laughs> kind of bold, wasn't it? Yeah. 
but this, uh, you know, he said, you know, well, you know, that's we're here to be prayed for. And so he had the 35 stand in a circle, and uh, he said he he leaned over and he prayed for just this one on this side, and their ears were opened, and then it started just going around, and and one by one, all 35 received their hearing. There was another young man that that would uh, pray for those that that uh, were sight impaired and, and blind and, and he would pray for them they'd receive their sight. These were the things that were going on at Azusa Street. Through the spring the, the, the uh, crowds were in the hundreds and then by the summer the uh, crowds were in the thousands. Well you can't get thousands of people in that building so they were they were outside they were just all over the street. Uh, the response was mixed uh, on one hand, there, obviously you're going to have misunderstanding, you're going to have disagreement, maybe even some hostility against what's going on. Uh, there were verbal and printed denunciations, you know, which was pretty common. But at the same time, on the other hand, multitudes had their spiritual thirst quenched by meeting with God. Soon, off, uh, soon after that, uh, Seymour and others began to uh, travel to other places and, and hold revivals, and, and God was doing great things across the country through them. The Azusa Street revival had two peaks. Uh, the first initial impact ran uh, continuously from the initial outpouring on Bonnie Bray Street in 1906 all the way to 1909, so about Three years was, was the initial peak of this revival. Uh, Seymour had started a, a newsletter called Apostolic Faith. And uh, so in this newsletter, he would give testimonies. He would do Bible study. He would, uh, you know, maybe uh, record some sermons or, or something like that, and, and it would go out. Uh, they had a subscription of 50,000 people across the country that received this newsletter, Apostolic Faith. And... Uh, so he put uh, the, the newsletter in charge, uh, two ladies in charge of the newsletter so that they would, you know, they would just take care of all that and he would deliver content to them and they would, they would print it and send it out. And uh, so this uh, also, it would inspire visits to Los Angeles. People would, would come after, you know, because they would read about it in the newsletter and then they would want to come. And also it was a source for donations. You know, they would say if you want to, you know, mail your check to cash or I don't know what they did in 1906. I wasn't alive then yet. I wasn't born until 1912. But, uh, but they, would, they would send donations to uh, Azusa Street, and that's really what kept the, the work going and, and helped sustain. I guess the one little box on the, on the wall couldn't you know, do all of it. And so um, then in uh, 1908, or uh, late in 1908, uh, William Seymour and Jenny Moore get married. And this made the two ladies that ran the newsletter upset. Oh, no. They were jealous. Some say they may have been jealous, but the, the official, like the official uh, grievance was that, well, why are you getting married? Because, you know, this great revival just means that Jesus is coming back. So you shouldn't be worried about getting married. You should just be preaching the gospel. And so they, they got all upset about it. So they take the newspaper, uh, the newsletter, and the... 50,000 subscribers. It wasn't on a computer cloud database at the time, right? It was on a, on a ledger sheet. And so they take it to Portland. And so instantly he goes from his newsletter that goes out to not having a newsletter. They kept sending a newsletter out, but they put a change of address for donations. So the donations for Azusa Street start going to Portland. And uh, so that, that coupled with a few other things, in 1909, uh, the, the work starts to die out, and, and the initial power, the initial outpouring, those things started to die down. Uh, there was a second peak that came in 1911 when William E. Durham came to preach at Azusa Street Mission. Uh, Durham uh, preached really kind of less legalistic. Remember, William Seymour was, uh, you know, kind of out of that holiness movement, so, you know, that was, that was very strict and legalistic. So Durham comes along, and he, he preaches a little less uh, legalistic brand of holiness, and Seymour didn't like that so much, so he kicks Durham out. And so when when Durham leaves, a lot of the crowd go with Durham. Uh, but uh, it seems kind of sad for a work like this, a powerful work like this, to end like it did. And, you know, we say, why why couldn't it just, you know, God, why didn't you just let it continue? 
You know, why was three years or why was, you know, a few years after even 1911, why, why was that like the only window of this and why did it die out? But it's true that a seed has to die before something would grow. And so that, that is work, as good as that work was, it had to go into the ground and it died. But when it did, thousands of Pentecostal groups sprang forth throughout America and uh, almost every part of the world. Uh, today there are more than 500 million Pentecostal and charismatic believers across the globe. And uh, it's the fastest growing uh, segment of Christianity today. Luke 14 28 through 29 says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Uh, this is where we get the phrase, the popular phrase, count the cost. Right? You've all heard that. What, is, what does that phrase mean to you, count the cost? When I was getting ready to get married, I had a talk with my dad and he was trying to be all real with me, you know, and so he uh, gets me to come up with everything I think it's going to cost me to be married and to live on my own. And so I, I come up with everything I could, and I come up with a total, he said, and I double it. <laughs> and that's what you're going to make. You know. uh, he was trying to help me count the cost, right? Uh, and all the ones that we've talked about, there's not been one where God just did something unexpected they were they were seeking and they were they were pushing they were they were uh, you know going after God and sometimes it, it costs uh, you know a lot of the early guys it cost them their lives to to seek God uh, you know a lot of a lot of people spent a long time in in prayer and some some that we talked about the the price that they paid didn't pay off until after they were already dead right. and then we see a, a move of God after after they were gone. Jesus explains that uh, being his disciple comes with a price. And preceding the verse that I just read, uh, if we jump back up to 26, it says, <clears throat> If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot, cannot be my disciple. Has it ever dawned on you in this verse that Jesus was telling them this before he went to the cross? You ever thought what was going through their head when Jesus is saying, you know, pick up your cross and follow me? It's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't get it. But what do you think they thought after the cross? And they started thinking about, back to what he said. Then it started making sense, right? started making sense. Now we know of course, you know, Jesus isn't promoting hate in this verse, is he? He's not literally saying, you know, I want you to hate your mom and dad because obviously that would be going against one of the 10 commandments that says honor your father and mother so your days will be long upon the earth. And Jesus is always talking about loving people and uh uh so uh, even loving your enemies. And so he's not promoting love, but what this is is he, he's uh, speaking hyperbolically about uh, a contrast between if we're going to follow him, then we need to follow him in in contrast to everything else in our life, right? That that it's not that your children don't matter to you, but when you look at how much Christ matters to you, and look at how much these others matter to you, the contrast is is stark. Uh, so preferring Christ above all else does, uh, does have a cost, and experiencing all God has for you is not free. What are some of the costs of following Jesus? Philippians 3, 7 through 10, it says, But whatever, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share 
his sufferings becoming like him in his death. That's coming from someone that they gave up everything to follow Christ. But he's saying, but there's so much worth in that. You know, we think giving up something for Christ costs us something. And it does. But he has so much more to return to us. The worth that Paul is talking about here in Philippians, that, that he returns to us, is so much greater than the cost that we give up. And it's, it's totally worth it. Now, if we truly, uh, if we're, we're truly reaching for more of God, then we're going to have to reach, or we're going to have to let go of some things, aren't we? Anybody know this guy? <laughs> you want to hear my Tarzan yell? No. <laughs> no? Somebody said no. Well, <laughs> no soup for you. Uh, <laughs> when, when Tarzan goes through the jungle and he's on that vine, and then when he reaches for that next vine, what does he have to do? What happens if he doesn't turn loose of this one? He's like, <laughs> and just hanging there, right? And motion stops because he's reaching forward, but he's not letting go of what's behind. And so if we're reaching forward, if we're trying to grab what God has for us over here, then there's some things here we need to let go of. I was talking to, I won't say who, but uh, one of the men in our church, and he was like, you know, he was having a conversation with his son and saying, you know, we have uh, this and this and this. And, you know, it's like you know, this hunting season and that hunting season and ball and, the, you know, and listing all the things and saying, we need to let go of some things. And so he said, we're going to pick two things and, and we're going to do those two things and we're going to devote the rest of that time to God. And I thought, man. That's what revival looks like. That's counting the cost. And that's saying, you know, all this stuff that I'm letting go of, it's not really valuable. I'm going to let go of this stuff. I'm going to let go of this vine so that I can swing into what God has for us. Verse 13 of that same chapter of Philippians says this, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to do what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus has set a prize before us. Yeah. Us meaning his church. And not just Elderated First Assembly, but his church. I believe he's ready for that next big move. And he's poised. He has the bucket turned up just a little bit. And he's ready to pour that out. If we're reaching for it, if we're stretching and if we're grasping, what are we willing to let go of so we can swing forward for the prize?